And thank you very much for joining us for this online webinar and interaction where we are going to unpack and better understand a recent Guttmacher Institute report that is focused on the key determinants of fertility in India. Now, this online interaction with the authors of the report is an excellent opportunity for us to delve into the crucial factors that determine a small family size in India. Where does the decision making lie? Who are the enablers of this decision making? What are the gaps? And more importantly, how all of this evidence can be used by policymakers and program implementers on the ground to ensure that men and women have good access to safe, effective, quality, and dignified reproductive health services in India. My name is Anubhav Musle. I'm an independent journalist and an entrepreneur and the founder of Newsworthy and the moderator for this session. Before I introduce my panelists and the authors of this report, I want to say a big thank you to the audience who's logged in. Thank you for some excellent questions that have already been put in in our chat box. This is just a reminder that the chat box function is on. It's being constantly monitored. So put in your comments as well as questions to the authors of the report. I'm going to make sure that a big chunk of the 60 to 90 minutes of this interaction is devoted to your questions and your comments. Well, let me introduce our panelists to you this evening. I'm being joined by Dr. Sushila Singh. She's the Vice President for Global Science and Policy Integration at the Guttmacher Institute. Dr. Sushila is joining us really early in the morning. So thank you very much for sparing this time. I also have Dr. Chandra Shekhar. He's a professor, Department of Fertility and Social Demography and Principal Investigator, National Family Health Survey, also at the International Institute for Population Sciences. Dr. Shekhar, welcome to the panel. Dr. Rajiv Acharya, Senior Associate at the Population Council. Thank you very much for joining us. Well, all three of them are actually going to speak to different facets of the report, but we thought it would be a good idea for Dr. Sushila to actually set the context for us and perhaps also give us a snapshot of the key findings of the Guttmacher report. Dr. Sushila, all yours. Thank you so much, Anuba. <clears throat> I'm very happy to give a quick summary, an overview. Um, so this study was published, first of all, early in this year and it addresses the key drivers of fertility levels and differentials in India at the national, state, and population subgroup levels. So as you know, improving sexual and reproductive health has been a focus of government policies and programs for decades. And it is against this backdrop that our study was designed to spotlight the key factors determining average family size in India. The study was a collaborative project between researchers at the International Institute for Population Sciences, IIPS in Mumbai, and Dr. Shekhar is here, the Population Council in New Delhi, represented by Rajib, and the Guttmacher Institute in New York. I would describe it as a joint project, not really just a Guttmacher project. Um, we used data from the National Family Health uh, survey, uh, the one that was conducted in 2015 to 16, combined it with data from a national study of abortion conducted in 2015. This is a strength of the study that data on abortion were available at for the same time period as the NFHS. So we analyzed these data to estimate the contribution of each of the four key determinants of average family size, which are women's age at marriage, contraception, abortion, and postpartum behaviors. The analysis provided estimates of the impact of these four determinants for key demographic and socioeconomic subgroups. Those were age, place of residence, education, wealth status, household wealth status, and caste. And these estimates are for the national uh, level and for each of the 29 states. 
We used a well-known demographic model, adapted it to the Indian context, and built on recent work by other researchers such as Jaya Chandran and Stover. These four key factors explain why family size today is much lower than the biological maximum, which is typically 10 or more children per woman, and also much lower than it was in India decades ago, where it was a, a little over six children per woman. Um, so our key findings um, are that marriage is the most important determinant of the reduction in fertility from the biological maximum, contributing 36% of the reduction, followed by contraception and abortion, contributing 24% and 23% respectively, and postpartum behaviors contributing the remaining 16%. The national pattern of contributions is found in most states and subgroups. However, findings suggest that a few factors were more important than average for certain areas or groups. For example, abortion makes a larger contribution than contraception among young women and better educated women. And we'll talk more about that later on. But overall, the absence of generalized differences between states and across socioeconomic groups in the role of these four key determinants suggests that as family size declined, fertility management has become increasingly homogenous. These findings support other research documenting the barriers that women in India face in obtaining good quality contraceptive services. The finding that abortion is an important method that women and couples use to achieve their family size goals, underscores the need for improved access to safe abortion care and adequate information on use of medication abortion. So we are really looking forward to the discussion and answering the questions and um, just um, hearing what you're interested in. So thank you very much. I'll hand it back to Anuba. Thanks uh, so much, Dr. Sushila. That was uh, incredibly useful. And just in case any of our audience members have joined in a little late, I'll just do a quick primer. Marriage is the most important determinant in the reduction in fertility <clears throat> at 36%, followed by contraception and abortion contributing 24 and 23% respectively, and postpartum behaviors standing at number four, contributing 16%. Dr. Sushila, I'm going to take it back to you and perhaps start with the most important or the key determinant of marriage playing a role in declining fertility levels. I think it'd be interesting mm -hmm. to just ask simply what about marriage and why marriage? There are two points I wanted to make. One is very straightforward. If a young woman marries at 15, for instance, compared to marrying at 21, there are six years when she's not likely to have children. So this can reduce the number of children she has she will have in her lifetime. That's just a basic point. But I think more importantly, these are crucial years for young women to complete their, their education, to develop their own identity as individuals. And a young woman at age 21 is likely to be more clear about her goals, what she wants out of life, to have a greater ability to influence decisions once she's married on such matters as how many children she would like to have compared to a young adolescent. And women are more likely to be in the labor force now than decades ago. So increasing their educational attainment is important for this reason as well. And it is these interconnections, just mentioning a few now, that lie behind the government policies to encourage parents to keep their girl children in school, to complete their education and avoid <clears throat> marrying at a very young age. Over to you. There are also obviously linkages about the age of marriage. And I'm wondering if any in any of your research, have you, you found any indications of age mm. of marriage of women versus age of marriage of men? Uh, <clears throat> um, we actually um, focused very much on the women in this study. And so we did not capture the age of marriage of men. Um, and I think in what we are looking at, which is childbearing, number of ch you know, children women are having, uh, there isn't a, a tight relationship there. 
Um, if you look at the extreme end of the spectrum and men who marry very, very late, um, this could influence the likelihood of becoming pregnant in terms of the sperm count and such factors, but we really don't capture that in this study. Thank you. Fair, fair enough, Dr. Sushila. Um, I want to focus on the age of marriage and Dr. Shekhar to you, the age of marriage for women has sort of steadily increased over the last decade. Women are marrying later in their life or when they're older. There is also a government intervention or a policy intervention of increasing the age of marriage for women from 18 to 21. How does all of this play into the family size? And can this be seen in isolation? Do they also have to be other socioeconomic indicators for this to actually lead to a small family, family size? Dr. Shekhar. I'll have to ask. Yes. As Sushila has uh, already mentioned, uh, I think at large, uh, that is very, uh, you know, true. Uh, in addition to that, as uh, she has pointed out that by the age of uh, 21 or, you know, at later age, you know, there's a lot of information uh, she, uh, you know, obtained from different resources, not only from education, but from peer group, peer group, educated group, or media, or even other like uh, government programs, for example, you know, account holding, which she can access to the mobile and other access to information resources. So kind of an women agency also in, in many other research seen that by age it increases, you know, and therefore the decision making becomes much more, you can say in her own hand, once this increase of age at marriage comes into picture. So other than that, as Sushila said, labor force participation and also the uh, you know, reduction in fertility, but these dimension as, as a whole in decision-making, in accessing to sexual and reproductive health rights, uh, all this you know, enables women once uh, she is like uh, married at later age um, compared to near 18 or below 18. Fair enough. Dr. Rajiv, when we're talking about marriage being this key determinant of reducing fertility, are we saying this at a national level? Is this homogeneous? Because there are parts uh, in your report that suggest that in some states, marriages have a notably larger than average contribution, whereas in some other states, they are lower. So what's really happening in the states that it's lower? I believe it's West Bengal, Tripurana, Sam. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Anuva, for the question. I mean, it is a bit complicated, you know, as uh, these are all relative contributions. Uh, one simple thing we should keep in mind when we are interpreting these results, uh, these four determinants that we are talking today, uh, marriage, uh, contraception, abortion, and uh, postpartum infecundability, uh, infecundability is uh, that more marriages mean more fertility, right? Uh, but more contraception, more abortion, and lengthier uh, infant period means lower fertility. So there are two different forces, two different kinds of forces are working on fertility here. And marriage is one that more marriages mean more uh, fertility. So uh, if we apply this, suppose in case of West Bengal, uh, which has the lowest uh, um, contribution of marriage in the in the fertility decline. Uh, if you notice in our paper, we have reported that percentage of women who are currently married is actually highest in West Bengal, which is 78%, which is much lower in many northeastern states and many southern states where contribution of marriage is higher. You get my point. So uh, that's one point. And I said it is relative. So you look at the other determinants, for example, postpartum infecundability is actually lengthiest in West Bengal and Tripura. It is 14 months, where the national average is seven months. So there are two different forces working here. Uh, and if you look at contraception, for example, again, West Bengal is a very high contraceptive use state. 57% uh, of women compared to 48% nationally are using modern contraception. So all together, um, we see a decline in fertility. The fertility is very low in West Bengal, but the contribution of marriage is uh, quite low 
because a lot of women are married uh, in West Bengal compared to um, other places. In Tripura, it is almost similar. It is like 24, 26, 25%. So I won't discuss that. I think that's an important point that you make about it being relative. And I'll take that to Dr. Sushila. But Dr. Rajiv, I think for the benefit of some audience, perhaps it would be good to explain postpartum infecundability, which would encompass what? I'm presuming postpartum behaviors. I think we'll discuss that later on where we are talking about breastfeeding and uh, during the complete breastfeeding, people cannot, uh, women cannot be fertile. Right. So that period and abstinence and those things all together, you, you determine how many months you are in pecan. Um, Fair so, enough. I think, yeah. yeah. But at this stage, we've got a good sort of basic grounding that this would be postpartum behaviors that lead to uh, women not engaging or that infertile period. Um, and Dr. Sushila, I think Dr. Rajiv brought us to the point where we are, uh, where it would be good to see how do these four determinants actually interact with each other. Uh, he used the word relative. Would it be good to understand that if one goes up, the other could go down? Uh, after all, these are all uh, services, uh, or two of them at least are services that women engage, uh, women need at different parts or different times in their reproductive life and journey. But what is the interplay between these four? Right, right. Thank you for that question. Um, and there's certainly a relationship between the four um, and they do trade off. And as Rajiv mentioned, um, where marriage made a smaller contribution, women marrying younger, having more children likely, the postpartum factor goes up in the contribution. And that's what we saw with West Bengal um, and, and some other states. Um, now, in the case of contraception and abortion, um, there is a very strong relationship. These are the two approaches that women, that couples and women are most likely to use to achieve family size timing of children. And where there's good access to quality contraceptive services, it tends to be that they will use more likely contraception to, to avoid unintended pregnancies. When there are gaps in access to quality contraception, Men and women are highly motivated to avoid having an unwanted birth or the timing of that birth isn't correct, they will turn to abortion. So th there is like a choice a little bit between these two, um, which can be affected by the quality of the care that women are getting. And what we see is that globally, it's true that the motivation to have smaller families will result in women having abortions, even where the law is strongly restrictive. Mm -hmm. and, and this tells you about the motivation. Um, now in India, the MTP Act, subsequent amendments, the recent Supreme Court ruling are granting access to unmarried women, even to, to all women in now and now to unmarried women, to um, quality, safe abortion care by policy and implementing the policies then becomes very important. Um, so the question is, do all socioeconomic groups have access to these services? Do all women, and you know, and that's what we need to focus on, both the access and the quality of the care. Um, and the basic fact is how important it is for both of these services to be available and accessible and of quality to all women of all socioeconomic backgrounds. I'll hand it over to you. Fair enough. Um, Dr. Sushila, Dr. Shekhar, you know, before I sort of, I think we focused a fair bit on marriage and obviously touched upon contraception and abortion, but before we sort of go deep into that, um, I saw a line in your report which said that the motivation, and I think you mentioned it, Dr. Sushila as well, that the motivation to, uh, to having a small family size is really all encompassing across uh, across age groups, across population subgroups. Uh, Dr. Shekhar, at the risk of sounding odd, I know the benefits of small family size. Are there any downsides to reducing fertility and small transitioning to small family sizes? <laughs> yeah, the, the, I think, uh, see, uh, long term if you have suddenly that uh, you know fertility brings down there are of course downsiding 
but india's you know fertility is not that suddenly reduced so it is a gradual in that sense i think i would say as we moving like smaller family size norms it would definitely affect in i mean our uh, you know population you can say stabilization uh, you know progress faster and in terms of that it would also give you resources which we had to put on more on child health child survival maternal health you know it can you know it can implement or any policy makers can actually have a resources to where require other places like you know women's empowerment or you know their rights or you know or even in other social sectors so it is it is an i think much uh, you can say uh, win situation and it has been you can say longing since uh, so many years and government have made population policy uh, in 2000 uh, accessing for family planning and other many other like age at marriage increased uh you know so 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 we are waiting that that now it is below replacement level and it has multi faceted you know benefits to the family as well as to women and society at large so i would say that uh, you know at this stage uh, we don't but long term uh, lowest low fertility have certain disadvantage which due course we have enough time to take uh, you know course of corrections for that you know in these situations fair enough uh, i mean i just wanted to confirm that uh, i want to move on to the next part and i think dr sushila referenced this in her opening remarks as well that the study is finding that abortion is an important means of fertility management for women and couples in all states and population subgroups and perhaps as important if not more when it comes to young women or educated women vis-a-vis -vis contraception uh dr shekhar yes what does that statement actually tell us okay so for now if you see in recent nfhs five younger women or i would say less than 25 years women is still we have a relatively higher unmet need for family planning hmm. so you know and it is double at the national level like you know around 18% compared to 9% at the national level unmet need for family planning level. now that is one situations where if unmet need is so high and you know particularly when i am talking about the young then now i am talking 15 to 19 age group uh, the demand satisfied by modern method is only 41% it means almost 60% women is still not able to meet their demand using modern method i mean we need to provide that it means if there is a fertility lower fertility norms set there they would resort to abortion correct because that is they are dedicated i would not like to have more than two children or one child now that is one second when you come about educated women particularly 12 and above years of schooling you see they are more depending or they are using uh, you know the traditional method one in every five women in that 12 years of education is using traditional method and two fifth of women are using either a condom or like lamb method so these are the methods which are like tend to have some sort of like uh, you know not so effective high efficacy as you know iud injectables or maybe you know uh, other uh, modern methods so what happens in this case uh, you know uh, if you are not consistently using condom you are not correctly using condom what happens you are tend to have the unintended pregnancy now in this case you again educated women they they are like again determined to have the uh, lower family size they would resort to that abortion so and in in an over and above india is a like a society which is discontinuation rate among modern spacing method is much higher 58 59% it goes 59% among all spacing method and you can imagine that out of this uh, it is nearly 46% related to side effect wanting more effective method and other reasons not the fertility uh, related reasons suppose why women should discontinue if she wants an egg child so only only out of total this discontinuation 
Sixty percent are reasoning that they discontinued because of side effect, because of wanting more effective methods and other reason, which can be very well, you know, taken up in the family planning program. Okay, only forty-one percent, uh, you know, saying that they want to have a pregnancy or they want to have a birth. So you can imagine we have lot to work on, you know, this quality as well as this reducing discontinuation rate. so that women should not resort to i mean you know so much in 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 case of abortion but still there will be some chance that method even most effective method have some uh, you know failure rate okay uh, so i think dr shaker you've sort of made a good connection between the availability of safe easily yeah. accessible modern methods of contraception and abortion before i look at a global picture and a worldwide picture dr rajiv i want to come to you because i think it's also important for us to send out this message that these are services as i said previously that women need at different times in their reproductive life and journey how do we see marriage how do we see contraception how do we see abortion and how do we see postpartum behavior from from a policy perspective i'm presuming marriage is part personal part social there is a great element of government interventions in two and yes there is a element of intervention in policy when it comes to postpartum behaviors as well but it could be limited how do we understand these four from that perspective knowing that we have your have the findings that you've given out for us now yeah uh, you know as you, you already said that so uh, for example um, i would say the two things that government can easily take up and work on more uh, is our contraception and abortion uh, where we can provide which is in government and which is in our hand to provide better services quality services and on demand services you know the high unmet need that shekhar pointed out is that women want uh, uh, contraception or abortion services but are not getting so uh, it is our responsibility to provide those so these are the two things that are easily manageable by the government uh, by through their programs and uh, spending money on those kind of services many things are there you know uh, one is that has to be easily accessible that's one thing uh, you have to Uh, target right kind of uh, groups for that. For example, uh, Shekhar talked about young women. Their unmet is the highest, so we target those women because there is some reason that they are not getting the services. Okay, either there is no knowledge, no access. There is uh, provider bias of not giving them uh, services. There are many other reasons uh, that are there. So we need to look at those, and these are the two easiest things that one can. Uh, do postpartum infertility infertility is little difficult to control by the government although we have policies policies of 6 months of maternity leave and all those things that are now being implemented has some effect on it but uh, it's largely women's aspiration what they want to do whether how soon they want to go back to the uh, workforce uh, post uh, post the abortion or post uh, pregnancy is is something that determines those kind of uh, factors and marriage as you said is a more of a social thing uh, we have legal provision of marriage age uh, 18 and 21 for long time now but that did not work for some time but once the education started rising among the females the marriage the early marriage is already is automatically coming down so we need to look at those social aspects and can work on that so there's a lots of policy implication of our findings uh, and i would say easiest uh, low hanging fruits are contraception abortion services good quality contraception abortion services accessible uh, respectful care should be provided i'm going to circle back uh, to you dr rajiv towards the end because we'll do a quick snapshot of the policy implications 
uh, and how all of this evidence can inform that. Uh, I just want to make a mention, uh, a couple of you from our audience members are uh, asking for the report that's been constantly referenced, uh, which uh, everybody has worked on, the panelists are the authors of this report, just to say that we will be sharing the entire report, the key messages, as well as excerpts from this interaction with you once the webinar is over. So you know, in case you'd also like it to be sent to other email addresses, just make sure you drop it in the email box. If you've registered, we already have your email addresses, but you'll definitely be getting a link to the full report as well as snapshots for this interaction. Um, Dr. Sushila, you referenced in your opening remarks those figures of 24 and 23% for contraception and abortion. Um, I wanted to ask you, are these roughly... Uh, the trends that would, we would see globally as well? Or do you think there's something mm -hmm. specific to the landscape in India, more specifically the abortion landscape in India? We've had an MTP Act, we've had amendments. You also mentioned the recent Supreme Court judgment that he related to unmarried women that makes this figure 24 and 23. Yeah, um, thanks for that question. Um, so. At, at the most broad and general level, I would say that the situation in India is not unique. It's not so unusual. It does fit the pattern typically found in the rest mm -hmm. of the world. And that is that when uh, women and couples want fewer children, they're going to use both of these approaches in one way or another at some point in their lives. Um, they're both important, um, but there is a trend um, on the long term, that where when family size is getting smaller, as small as it is now in India, that contraceptive use tends to rise and abortion to decline. So if you look back to when family size was maybe four, at, at the point where um, the society is getting much more used to the accessing contraception, abortion might become even more important in contraception for a while. Then they start, contraception is rising, abortion stays high. And the very long term, and you see this in some countries now in, in the West, um, contraception takes over on abortion. Um, so, so this is like where I see the future for India, providing good quality contraceptive care comes readily accessible to the young women as well as everyone else and to a better to all women. Um, that's where the direction will probably be going. At the moment, the fact that it's about the same contribution, it's not like ter ter uh, very unusual, but it is something to pay attention to in terms of what is telling us of where the effort needs to be, because we are already at two children per woman, roughly. and um, this trade-off needs to go in that direction, I think. We've already uh, stressed the importance of access to abortion. And I want to say here again, contraceptive methods will fail. Life circumstances change. You, a, a person may become ill. The fam family member is ill. Unemployment. Um, a union di dis dissolves. The marriage breaks up. Your situation changes and what was a wanted pregnancy at the time it was conceived becomes an unwanted, unintended birth. And you need access to abortion in many situations that will not go away. So you continue to need both services. The question is, can we improve on the contraceptive angle in terms of quality, uh, the variety of methods offered, follow-up care, etc., to support women and couples in having a good choice, a, a quality care, and, and give them a fair shot at at using methods when they want to. Um, I think, uh, Dr. Sushila, that's such an um, important, not caveat, but I think such an important aspect that you've underlined, that we need both services. I'm going to take the next question to both Dr. Rajiv and Dr. Chandrasekhar. Uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Rajiv first. Um, what would be, from a public health perspective, that ideal number or that ideal ratio of contraception versus abortion? Uh, is there a scope for it to change in India? I, I know the answer a little bit, but what would it lead for that needle to move? 
Dr. Rajiv, you first, and then Dr. Shekhar could follow. Yeah, but um, I, I don't know whether, uh, I, as Sushil has already mentioned, that it will naturally change once the contraceptive uh, use increases. I mean, we have a very high contraceptive use now uh, already, although not everything is modern method. There is a lot of traditional method use. And interestingly, traditional method use is actually increasing in India. It increased by 4% uh, during 2015-16 and 1921. But if we are only, we are talking about only things that we can control is the use of modern contraceptive, which uh, still have about 10, 12% unmet need. If we fulfill those, we'll have about 60% um, women using uh, modern method of contraception. Once so many women uh, are using modern contraception, the demand for abortion will go down. I mean, that's definitely. But then as Sushil also mentioned that we can make that change through our program and policies and through our improved contraception, uh, I mean, improved family planning program or the contraceptive services, I would generally say. We need to look at young women, unmarried women, and many other segments which are underserved and uh, also provide good quality services. As Shekhar mentioned at one point of time, the discontinuation rate is still very high. We, we Our quality improves, and we have evidence that discontinuation will also decrease. So we I think the substantial decline in fertility along with high contraceptive use will reduce, will change this ratio 23-24 in favor of contraception at some point of time. Uh, Dr. Shekhar, anything you'd like to add? I would like to add two things here. One is that you see it's a, as you should, it's a very natural pattern. Even this original you know, model, when 1978 Bungards gave this model, he used 43 you know, countries data, what fertility survey data, and he found that as the fertility uh, reduces, goes to below three in his like this thesis, uh, the abortion contribution increases. So as fertility comes down, in, it's a 43 word, word fertility survey, you know, data at that point of time, India was not part of that. So even in our study, we found that in an, if you go take that by education category all over the countries, all the states and country, we found that the contribution of abortion was as low as 9%. And as I has was 35% in other groups. So you can say it's a range. I mean, we cannot say it is an ideal, but you know, it's a different stage of fertility. It would come and as said that, you know, settle down. But what I would say that, you know, in addition to this, as you said, public health point of view, I think it is necessary to build a contraceptive secure society, friendly society, contraceptive friendly society, contraceptive benevolent environmental, you know, kind of an aspect into this affordable, free of coercion, as well as most important, the contraceptive approach of any, whether government or private sector, has to be dependent on, constructed on right way gender ecosystem as also in, in, in addition to that, because this abortion and contraception are both a very important part of meeting the you know, uh, goal of women's uh, you know, fertility or preference. You cannot avoid it. Now, the, what important is that quality of services, as Rajiv and uh, Shushila has already pointed out, uh, we need to make service provision in remotest part of the you know, our case. So that is uh, you know, most important. And then second, which I would like to add here is that, you know, even if you see that when it comes to the decision and women get pregnant and then there is an like what happens it's in such a mental mm. state of for, of a woman that you know she cannot discuss now to anyone sometime there should be a kind of a system whether it is like we had seen some of the um, this is that whether it is like a you know uh, i call kind of services or like counseling on over phone something has to be that this that mental state only women can know it's very difficult that when she come to know she's pregnant and there is no set kind of an education so that's why i'm saying sexuality education or education regarding sexual rights uh, is it should be promoted at least from beyond a school level 
that's very important part of curriculum even i am teaching here postgraduate and graduate student if you ask them a question whether abortion is legal in our country more than 70% says it is illegal this is my irony i mean i am very upset about this that we don't know our policy our rules our regulations our laws for women and women are replying this it is no one, none other than that these are postgraduate women and uh, every every year new women i am asking first question when i take class of fertility i ask this first question every year whether in our country abortion is legal so why we are having this phobia why we are having this kind of a mental block we need to educate our young generations regarding these rights and uh, you know laws and things thank you Sure. I think that you've given us uh, so much to squeeze out from that statement, but I'm going to take a contraception friendly society, a rights based perspective, a gender based perspective, uh, improving, I would say, the contraceptive basket. Right. Uh, I think a, a couple for women and just two for men. Uh, I think that someone joked to me ages ago that I think we have more serial brands in this country than we have contraceptives mm. for men. And of course, uh, an education about rights that we have our reproductive rights the supreme court of this country has given some great far reaching um, judgments in that favor um i know we've spent a lot of time on contraception and abortion and that interplay uh, dr sushila i want to explore postpartum behaviors but i think it would be useful for us and our uh, for our audience Uh, to know what all it encompasses and how it actually plays an important role reducing family size thanks <laughs> yeah that's it's important to pay attention to this factor as well um so with with postpartum behaviors we're really talking about breastfeeding and in and to some extent abstinence after giving birth um both of these will reduce the likelihood of a woman becoming pregnant in the months following delivery um so uh breastfeeding is a protection it delays uh the return of the menstruation uh so you're not at risk for a certain period of months um and the behaviors by increasing the length of the time between births are reducing the number of births the woman can have so if you were to go back prior to any contraceptive methods here in india um you would find that um breastfeeding was much longer and a very important factor in um explaining uh why family size wasn't 10 children but 6 children say um now more recently um the behavior is changing women are breastfeeding for shorter periods it it even in the last uh say decade it declined from around 8 months on average to about 6.6 that doesn't sound like a big difference but it is a substantial decline i haven't um, maybe shekar can add after me what it is in the most recent survey this was in the prior two but that's that's a you know a substantial decline um and this is this is why the factor is now making so much smaller the smallest contribution to fertility uh, levels being where they are um and yet we have to remember that breastfeeding is very important for the health of infants and um and that when women are working it becomes harder to maintain breastfeeding um if they're not supported to do so at their places of employment um now the government policy that was just recently passed to provide 6 months maternity leave with pay that's definitely a good step uh, a step in the right direction and making it easier for new mothers to breastfeed at least for that period of time um and that means it's very important to see this policy being implemented um we can have very good policies sometimes and they're not followed and so it's a question of private Uh, private employers as well as public actually taking this seriously and seeing the value to women's and infants health and actually implementing it um but um maybe that's enough for now for on that yeah thanks mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, i mean it's crucial to say here that there is a space for policy makers to uh, put in policies not just perhaps 
at the government level, but also perhaps at the private sector. Um, I know, Dr. Sushila, you, Dr. Shekhar, would you like to add to what the recent figures say? Uh, I think this recent figure, if you see median uh, duration of uh, this uh, aminoria is basically 4.1 month. And because there are cultural practices also after this uh, abstaining, so if you that include, we called it, uh, you know, uh, uh, median duration of insusceptibility where women cannot get pregnant is basically is 6.3 months. So it has reduced, I mean, amenoric, uh, amenorrhea, which is because of breastfeeding period is 4.1 is, is estimated in NFHS, uh, you know, 5, 2019 and 21. So that would be like a kind of an, it is an, an, and it is seen that in, in other society also other country, as modernization take place, it reduces, okay. Fair enough. Um, I think we've all mentioned NFHS 5 a couple of times in our answers. Uh, Dr. Shekhar, I think it's an important caveat to put out. Uh, how, how do these find, how should these findings be seen or how do they get impacted? considering they're based on 2015 and we do have figures from NFHS 5. So you see that uh, particularly this, even you fit on NFHS 5, you won't find very different result, uh, particularly because as Rajiv has mentioned, it are relative figures, okay? And uh, you can see maybe little because NFHS shows little improvement in, in uh, you know, uh, this uh, modern contraceptive use, you may see some state there is an increase in uh, maybe contribution of uh, you know family planning, but uh, or more or less the story remains same. Uh, it's, it's not going to be changed. And uh, there are some people have already not published, but I could see that uh, it has not done. Those are evidence in, in that sense, because it's a very small period changing, uh, you know, 2015, 16 and uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 19, 21. And particularly, you know, when you take that, it is like taking a story of five years back. So somehow, you know, kind of a period also overlap in terms of, you know, fertility uh, estimation. So it's not going to change the story much, but uh, that is the thing. But as the family planning has improved in certain states, uh, contribution may uh, be, uh, you know, maybe like a little higher side to the family planning. Maybe. Anything you'd like to add, Dr. Rajiv and Dr. Sushila, to this? Um, I, I would add that in conclusion from what Shekhar just said, this findings of this study remain very relevant because of that, that um, it is a trend in for all of these four factors, slow change over time. Yes, there will be more updated information but the relationship we're seeing and the implications for policies and programs remain highly relevant. Yeah, I agree too. Fair enough. I think you all brought us to the point, uh, the big chunk of it as to how can all of these details, how can all of this evidence actually inform policy decisions and program implementation. Dr. Sushila, I want to start with you. One of the first recommendations in that report is improving mm. public education on both contraception and abortion. Uh, what do you believe the gist, the juice, the focus should be of this information dissemination? Yeah, um, that's why we do research is to hope to improve policies and programs. Um, and uh, Shekhar uh, spent a bit of time already uh, on one part of that recommendation, which is the importance of comprehensive sex education in schools and, you know, maybe thinking through the curriculum accurate, make sure it's accurate information at the right ages, developmentally uh, adjusted as children get older increasing the information they get. Um, this is absolutely foundational knowledge. It, uh, it will inform the rest of their lives and improve their sexual and reproductive health throughout. So it just is very important to see this happen. And it's really difficult to persuade parents and communities that this is not gonna have a negative effect, but I just wanna mention there is no research showing that it will have a negative effect in any way. 
and and everything is to be gained from this. Um, so that's one big part of it. But there's also need for information on all aspects of, of sexual and reproductive health and the, the service-oriented ones that we mentioned. But, the, but you know, even uh, the postpartum area should be paid attention to in, in general education for the public. So I'm thinking of how little the various media that we have at our control are used to, to convey this information, what methods are available. You can use the, the traditional um, media, you can use the new electronic and internet-based media um, to reach young people, for instance, you, you have to tailor how you provide the information, but we need to, um, to, to do much more with that. Um, and I, I would say that the third way would be interactions with providers. So when you actually go for a visit to obtain a method, getting full information, more tailored because it's you and the provider, it is more tailored to your needs. That is very important too. I mean, the media can give you the overall, the broader, the, the general, um, but you need specific for yourself. Um, and it, it's information to do with what are your options? What are, what are the various methods of contraception and abortion too? There's medication abortion and, and medical methods, and then there's surgical methods. What what might make a difference for you? What would you prefer to choose? You wouldn't know if you are not aware of that that those methods. Um, I did mention um, that. Let's see. On the air, we're going to get a discussion, I hope, about some the safety of abortion and what methods are out there. But I'll take the chance, the opportunity now to say there is a great gap in, in availability of information on medication abortion, specifically, um, which can be self-managed. And so I would just mention that here. There isn't enough public education about that. Um, um, I was uh, also going to mention a new tool that that we have just put out. I, I take the chance to do that now, that, that when we're trying to influence, use all of what we've studied here to influence policies, having a mechanism to calculate what, what, is, the, what is the gain, the benefits from investing, for instance, in family planning. We need tools to, con to, con to convert the money we are asking policymakers to spend into how many unintended pregnancies are we really preventing? What are the health gains from that? Um, and there's a new tool that we've just released that we can provide also when we give follow-up information to the audience that I think could be very helpful um, in India. And I'll let others add now. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I think I'll go through the recommendations also, perhaps one by one. Uh, Dr. Rajiv, there is a recommendation in the report relating to ASHA workers. We know they're sort of the face, the muscle, the grip, the grime yes. of the Indian public health system. Uh, what A, are the recommendations saying? And B, perhaps also a chance for us to delve a little deeper on how do ASHA workers and the information they provide actually influence family planning choices? Do they, do they really make the cut? Is there enough evidence that we have that ASHA workers do indeed influence families to either go in for contraceptive methods or take them for other procedures? Yeah, um, very good question. And actually, uh, uh, when we are talking about making stronger, better contraceptive services, uh, we, we need to talk about how ASHAs can contribute to that. In fact, uh, we discussed in our paper also there is evidence outside our paper uh, from NFHS, uh, different rounds of NFHS uh, with that uh, uh, frontline workers, not only ASHAs, but even the, even the ANMs or the other frontline workers have very significant role to play in providing contraceptive services. And, and then evidence is the one that you are asking. 
uh, that do make any uh, difference in their lives. Yes, uh, we, our research shows that uh, if a current non-user of contraception, uh, uh, a person who is not using any method right now, had a recent interaction with a frontline worker, uh, they are more likely to express the intention to use in the near future, which means uh, they are getting influenced to use in very near future. Also, in general, also, if there's a discussion about family planning or the contraceptive methods uh, between a couple and um, AMs or the uh, FLWs or ASHAs, uh, um, there is evidence that they are more likely to use uh, contraceptive. So yes, there is a huge impact and it is, it is so strong, it's like uh, can double up your contraceptive use. Okay, so so ASHAs are already trained and equipped to provide information, uh, guidance to couples um, on how, what to use and in their situation, what is the best. Yes, there may be some bias somewhere uh, because ASHAs are also, you know, within the same community. So there will be some bias, uh, what they say, but still they have required information and training to uh, provide information to uh, to advise on the fertility management uh, for, for couples. So they are well placed. Uh, they are very well placed to dispel the myths about contraception methods. That something has a very high side effect or this or that or weight gain. Many other myths about some of the methods we have and ashas can actually dispel those because they have right information to uh, dispel those methods. So they should be, they should, and and as I said before also, our focus now should be young women, low parity women who have high unmet need and ashas can easily do it because they track, if you look at their register, they track every woman from marriage to whatever reproductive events are happening in their life. So they are very well placed to do with young women. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just pushing it a little more, Dr. Rajiv. Uh, and I think you mentioned it, mentioned it slightly that the Ashas are also coming in from the same community. So the chances of their biases also exist in the same form. And you also mentioned young women and their needs for contraception. I'm wondering if there is a, a clear policy recommendation or a clear insight that you have that marries information dissemination that's clear, that's rights-based, that is perhaps targeted to younger women and disseminating it through ASHA workers. Yeah, we need a lot of training of ASHA workers because um, I mean, as I said, there is training. There is a certain amount of training given to ASHA workers before they're inducted into the community. And they actually talk about a lot of those things that we're talking about now. But implementation or their understanding, you know, I'm, I'm giving an example, a, a ASHA worker going to a young girl's family who just got married, came to that community, and and telling her that you should use contraception may not be very well taken by the family. And she has that in her mind and that prevents her to give those information to the woman. So um, it's, it's not only the bias is not because of her own training or her own uh, being in the community, similar kind of community, but also because the situation she is working in. Okay, I mean, we have quite good amount of research on uh, provider bias uh, in providing contraceptive to young women, unmarried women in particular. And they, they, they all talk about the community reaction to their work. So there is a lot of things to be done at the community level with the ASHA workers to improve this situation. That's fantastic. In a lot of my field work, I've often found ASHA workers actually speaking to mother-in-laws before they speak to new brides to actually convince them that, hey, you will right. benefit from a small family size. Um, another thing uh, that perhaps stands out in the Indian landscape, Dr. Shekhar, are hysterectomies. They happen with a fair amount of frequency and there is enough reportage study on the ground that they happen for a whole host of reasons that may sometimes have nothing to do with family size. You know, intrauterine infection, you could go in for an hysterectomy. I know that in part of your report, you mentioned 
the word coercion to some extent. And I think in the hysterectomy scenario, or while speaking about that, there is a tendency for many healthcare workers to inform women or slash misinform women that, hey, if you've had two children, you've finished your reproductive responsibilities, I say that with quotes, uh, why not go in for this? It's all simple, done, finished, etc. Uh, what do you believe can be a decision from a policy perspective uh, with the findings that we have and the insight that we have from your report? Yeah, thank you, uh, Anuba. This is very interesting. I mean, dimension you caught. We never imagined you will catch that dimension of the study. <laughs> but I would like to just state a few things uh, quickly. See, uh, one, one thing that we need to see, as I said, you know, it has to be much wider, you know, approach of reproductive health. And in that sense, any reproductive morbidity, even it very mild, has to be treated at very initial stage. So when, if there is a too much delay, as you said that, you know, women and, uh, you know, providers both comes into the consensus that, you know, it is better now to get rid of it because there is no need after having family size this womb. But that is not correct in the sense that, you know, uh, we need to have this first, uh, you know, at very initial stage of treatment and screening of these kind of infections. And we need to build up also and kind of a knowledge because there is an ignorance about a whole lot of ignorance about the morbidity and the reproductive health. And women think in general in, in rural area or even in, in general that these are part and partial of their life, even a small infection, but which carry to that later age and ultimately you have to get, uh, you know, this kind of surgery, unfortunately. So what happens in, in, if you see, we wrote a paper in 2019 and published in Reproductive Health on 2000, you know, the NFHS 1516. What we found, basically the major regions were, we found as women, like what was the region? Menstrual bleeding and severe pain was almost more than 56% women who underwent to the estrochromy said that this was major region. Now, this should not be the major region. It's a basically, you know, well-managed. It can be very well-managed, pain and bleeding. Another reason which I followed is that, you know, uterine disorder ruptured and prolapse, which was almost, you know, 20 or one-fifth of women. And then fib fibroids and cysts were also the next leading cause. So three major le leading cause were there, which women reported that because of they went to this, uh, you know, uh, uh, surgery. The associated factor was, as you said, very rightly that, you know, that need, higher parity women, because already that fertility, you know, achieved and is low schooling or no schooling and a very low age at marriage. It is directly connected to somehow to this all disease, which I have mentioned earlier to, if you have a very low age at marriage, you tend to have all this, uh, you know, what women reported are caused behind this. So there are, of course, there are report of coerciveness in some part and that have been also documented in literature, but then it's major is this public health or you can say reproductive health arena, which we need to uh, tackle it uh, by knowledge, information and quality services from very beginning the, as the, you know, the disease occur. So it has to be like, even there is some, you know, normal uh, period disturbance and other, you know, heavy bleeding, we should not ignore. We need to see what cut, what are the cause and in the public health system should be accessible to that at the initial stage. And, and solve for that. Um, um, ladies and gentlemen, I have to say that we have a couple of questions coming in and perhaps if there are more specific policy recommendations that you'd like to make, we could take them and be taking the questions. Uh, I'll wait for some of those questions to load in, but really to all of you, um, I want to sort of wrap up this discussion with an aspect uh, that rarely gets touched, especially when we talk about reproductive health care, sexual and reproductive health and rights. Uh, you know, yes, we're moving and transitioning towards a small family size. Yes, women are now playing a greater role. Their age of marriage is steadily increasing. They have sort of greater agency on when they want to have a child. They're taking a decision related to spacing. There are lots of victories, but 
one of the things that often gets lost is how are we dispensing this reproductive care? Are we doing it in a dignified manner? Are we taking care of uh, the surroundings in which it is being done? Are we taking care of their mental health? Uh, is there an element of uh, slight coercion, not intended, but unintended coercion with how we are talking to women? Are we talking to men enough? Uh, in sort of conclusion, would you like to say a few words about, about this aspect, about reproductive health care being dispensed in a dignified manner? Dr. Sushila, would you like to kick it off? Um, sure. Um, I think you've, you've brought up a very important piece of the picture here. Um, we pay a lot of attention to making services available, just simply having it there. That's the first challenge, making actually quality care. By quality, I meant clinically, you know, the right meeting recommended standards. But we don't think enough about how the care is delivered. Um, and with sexual and reproductive health services, it's actually even more important because it's personal, it's a sensitive topic, it's a stigmatized area community-wise. And when you talked about ASHA's and their situation in the community, this it relates that to that, that part of it too, that there is really, it really is important to the training to include the respect that women should be treated with, women and men, whoever is coming in for a sexual reactive health care service. It's actually more important to think about how you talk to them, not being judgmental if it's an unmarried woman, not, not treating a woman as, you know, it's, it's not her place, not her right to request something, but, but looking at this person, this, this client as, an, as in need of a service, you're going to do your best you're going to try to connect with her and and listen and respond. Now, I'm saying all of this, and I know that it can be pressures of demand of how many how many people you have to serve, how much pressure is on the provider. Um, and yet they have to be able to balance that pressure with this important as aspect. So we're asking a lot of providers, and I think bringing attention to this area is where we need to go more as well. Um, so I'll let Shekhar and Rajiv add to that. Sure. Rajiv, do you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, recently we were doing a um, study on women who have accessed abortion from chemists. You know, the, with, with the medical abortion drug that directly bought. So we asked them that you had option of going to a doctor and get this prescription written, proper advice given to you, why did not you go to a health care provider for abortion? And many of them actually say is, is that the way the doctor treats them once they go and request for abortion is something prevents them to go to them, right? So yes, so empathy, dignity are uh, very low in some of the places some of the situations and some of the type of clients, I would say, you know, maybe in quality of care, when we look at there are many aspects, physical quality versus uh, those aspects of uh, interactions between provider and uh, patients. And, and we find that oftentimes this is one area of concern that yes, they are not getting that empathy. They, they, they would, uh, would like to have you know i have seen uh, saying uh, somebody is asking for abortion and being said why did you even have sex you know if you did not want the child so is that kind of responses put them off and they try to go to some other place not go not go to the provider so yes it's a very important thing we need to work on it and we need to find out how in this crowded hospitals, we can still maintain dignity of patients, both in terms of interpersonal uh, interactions, also the privacy uh, in which they can be served. Yeah. Yeah. 
Anubhav, we can't hear you. No. Um, yes. Now, now we can. No, sorry. So I said just quick comments from you and then uh, we can take in a couple of questions that have come in from the audience members. Okay. It's, I think Rajiv said and Sushila said, uh, you know, absolutely the correct. But what I would say that, you know, it has to be whole attitude of the providers and the bridging person because bridging person also very important, whether it's a relative or friends or so we need to see as a whole through education attitude. The medical curriculum is should take care of all this. Uh, uh, you know, they will need to be educated about rights, privacy, and confidentiality. Uh, and at least, uh, I mean, as far as I would say that, you know, abortion, uh, you know, rights, you see that most of the facility saying family planning is available, method available. I hardly see any facility, be it uh, public or private, that abortion is available. What you see here, you know, what you see on that here, sex selective abortion not done. But it is not seen that abortion is done. So how a common woman will interpret it that abortion is not done. Here. So I requested Mumbai Municipal Corporation, we had a meeting with doctors that at least you display and they agree to display that. So at least it should be done at primary health level or community health level that this is provided here and confidentiality is maintained, your information, though government has now much more strict law, but it has to be seen at ground level. And then... I think that's, sorry, Dr. Shekhar, to interrupt, but I think that's such a key, important messaging and communication aspect, right? That could solve so much. I mean, yes. we know... Um, we know that the IPAS Development Foundation also does some key work with providers when it comes to abortion. Uh, I have a couple of questions and I could point them towards uh, one out of you, but please feel free uh, for anyone to respond. Uh, Fuzzle's asking a question specifically about rural India and the determinators of fertility. Um, Dr. Sushila, do you want to see, do you want to answer that? Um, or anybody could, I, I don't want to put anyone in the spot, so to speak. But um, I think Fuzzle's question is basically about, is there anything different uh, about these determinants as far as rural India is concerned? I'll, I'll let uh, Shekhar Rajiv step in here. Shekhar? Yeah, uh, so I think uh, you see that definitely marriage is uh, low. I mean, age at marriage is low. So you have a contribution, lower contribution of marriage. If you see in, uh, out of this proximate determinant, the contribution of, let's say, you know, uh, kind of this uh, uh, contraception may be a little higher, uh, you know, compared to urban. But what I would say that, you know, even the postpartum infecundability is, is still the norms are like longer breastfeeding in rural area. So you would see tend to be a little higher. So it is like an, you know, very uh, connected picture to that. <laughs> I, would say, yeah, I would say, you know, 80%, 75% of our population is rural, right? So our national figures uh, represent most of the rural uh, experiences that we have. Um, as as Shekhar said, yes, I'm just looking at the table and it shows that the marriage has less contribution and postpartum infecundability has uh, higher than urban uh, contribution. So. Uh, Saurav has actually a question on LARC methods, sort of the long acting reversible contraception methods, IECD, et cetera. Um, he's making a statement, why are they not so popular among rural women uh, in India? I'm not quite sure. I wouldn't have data offhand to see if it's factually correct. Uh, and then he has a, a follow-up question that is it linked more to the supply side issues or the side effects uh, which uh, women sometimes experience with the insertion of some of these? Uh, I, I don't know that it is uh, something to do with, you say rural women, but I yeah. don't think it's something specially to do with rural women. Um, LARCs are, uh, yes, not as popular as condoms, for example, uh, in, in India. Or sterilization, of course, is a very different kind of method. Uh, but uh, among the spacing method, LARCs have not been very uh, successful here. 
There are many reasons. I don't want to go into some of those reasons that are not supply side, but also quality of care comes into picture here. You know, so um, so you end up not having a right procedure or rightly done procedure. End up having complications, and then you spread that word to your known people, and it it gets gets a bad name. That okay, you know, if you have IOD, you have these 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 kind of issues. Okay which is probably not true, uh, but yeah. nobody is dispelling those myths. No, nobody is talking about that. We, we need to have a completely different strategy from both provider perspective and from the client perspective to improve our LARC. Um, Priya Nanda, uh, one of our audience members has put in a question and perhaps I could take it to you, Shikhar. Uh, she's asked specifically on can you comment whether shifting age of marriage 18 to 21 uh, has had any specific benefits like a delayed first birth? Yes, De you know, definitely it would have. Like if you see estimate of NFHS 5, the median age at first birth is uh, 21 years. So if 21 year itself is marriage, then women will have many things, not this year, next year. So average would be much higher in that sense. And that would, uh, I mean, ultimately, as I said, affect on child survival, women's health, and other sort of agencies. It would definitely affect. So that's true. Uh, Dr. Harshita Jain has a question. Um, she says, we're a developing nation. We've been focused on reducing our TFR. But with the current shift a in the age of marriage and also also a larger focus on reproductive rights, should new policy slash programs also focus on techniques for late pregnancy and fertility and create this awareness among community? I think you've all answered parts of it, but it would be good to take it. What are those techniques for late pregnancy, Sushila? I think, I think um, she is referring to yeah. the greater difficulty in becoming pregnant. Uh -huh. uh, so. So not, not necessarily primary infertility, but mm -hmm. a secondary issues of um, needing advice, starting with counseling. But then there are um, treatments, should there be a, a true problem in becoming pregnant. Um, but um, I, I think this is a good question and an important one that it isn't like the majority of women are going to wait until late 30s or age 40, but uh, increasing percentage will do that as the age at marriage rises and more women are working and having careers. Uh, this is certainly a trend in the rest of the world. And so I would expect, I haven't actually looked at the recent data on this for India, but um, it, it is coming if it hasn't yet already been seen. Um, and it is important to think about infertility, let's just call it that for now, a simple word, but um, degrees of infertility, degrees of needing help to become pregnant, not just to prevent pregnancy, that, that this is an important aspect of sexual and reproductive health care. And um, India is at the point where we they, it needs to be considered as well. Um, and I know it's a different point of view, a different area of need than we have been talking about for decades, but this is the time, and I agree with the questioner, that we do need to pay more attention to this. Uh, Anuva, I would like to add that Government of India has passed, uh, you know, assisted reproductive technology bill, and it is like taking all stakeholders' opinion at that point of time. So it's sort of like give you that kind of an avenue that how do you I mean, how these uh, set of women can, you know, help from the program and policy. Only thing it has to be much more like popularized or, and, and has to be like known at the grassroots level. So already we have a ART, you know, a technology and. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm like, sorry, go ahead, Rajiv, go ahead. I'm, I'm just thinking that if you look at uh, the, uh, the kind of assistive technology available now in India and being advertised uh, that this, this is available and people can access that and that those kind of advertisements even more number of advertisement you see you see the board somewhere when you travel which means that healthcare 
uh, industry is already sensing that and pro started providing those kind of uh, assistance. Yes, but the government policies and programs should support that, which uh, Shekhar is saying is already being done. Fair enough. Uh, I think that brings us uh, to the end of this interaction. I'll still give the final word if there's something uh, that I've missed out on asking or a, a robust policy recommendation that you'd like to make. Uh, Dr. Rajiv, Dr. Sushila, Dr. Shekhar, I think we, we have a couple of minutes for us to do that uh, before I thank our audience. Yeah, I think I would like to point out here, we need a much more broader study, uh, you know, on reproductive health and reproductive, you know, kind of, and this all uh, of services provisions and in supply, big supply side things, you know, because we already have from NFHS some data, but it does not help to analyze, uh, you know, those kind of approaches, okay? Mm -hmm. So we need a much larger study in that sense and much uh, uh, focus and intensive study on uh, uh, reproductive health and where, uh, you know, system, maybe health system, maybe interviewed or, you know, some of like, we need to take a much more comprehensive holistic approach to give much more, you know, idea and policy feedback. Because, Fair yes. Dr. Rajiv and then Dr. Sushila, um, you can have the last word. I would just add to that data need part, you know, uh, if you have read the first part of our paper, we already said that what is different in our paper is that we are able to use the 2018 uh, study of abortion uh, incidents that we did in, in the country and use that data into this. And before that, any other study could not use uh, such kind of data. So there is a need that we repeat those kind of studies um, so that this kind of exercises to look at the uh, determinants of low or high fertility can be actually uh, examined. Dr. Sushila? Um, just to correct, 2015, not 2018. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, small matter. Um, but the point I would cl close with is to do with uh, safety of abortion. And um, we touched on it along the way. Um, I would like to emphasize a policy recommendation to do with better information on an access to medication abortion. Um, we didn't have much time here, but there is much studies and our own as well that show how poor the knowledge is about the exact process of using what to expect, how to use the method. It is a very straightforward process to use. It can be self-managed safely um, with some medical backup available when needed, which is very infrequent if it is used correctly. It's highly effective and safe. Um, the question is that the information that women are getting might not be adequate. And that that does appear to be the case from the research based on what Rajib said of the study that you did with chemists and studies that we've done others as well. So I would just emphasize that while we improve all the other aspects of sexual reproductive health care. Let's not forget this one. And um, it is a very, um, it's available from the chemists, that's good, but how can we get the information improved? And maybe Rajib or Shekhar can add something on mechanisms to do that. Um, I would just emphasize the importance of this method becoming uh, more accessible, more supportive, um, and, and so on. So I'll end with that. Thank you. Fair so I'll, I'll take that as the last word. Better, more robust information on the availability, the safety, and the efficacy of medical abortion. On that note, I'll end Dr. Sushila, Dr. Rajiv, and Dr. Chandrasekhar. Thank you very much. Also, a big thanks to our audience uh, for joining in, continuing to join in at various parts of this online webinar. Just a reminder, we'll be putting out excerpts of this interaction, a full link to the report, as well as key messages of the Guttmacher Institute report uh, on these key determinants of fertility in India across various platforms, social media, websites, etc. We nevertheless have your emails, so just look out for an email from all of us.
with that, thank you very much. Thank you.